to welcome our guest uh today from gsd venture studio derek derek sir and gary sir so uh, prakash sir please give a, a brief introduction of uh, uh today's speaker and then we will invite them for for today's session we are having our startups and students who are interested in startup uh, startups so they are also with us and we will make this uh 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 this data with us uh, also and uh, it it's been great to be connected with gsd venture studio and kalchuri lncit group incubation center so we are based in central india and our focus area is healthcare agriculture technology and uh, uh, and uh, and technology based uh, uh, startups so we are we are curating many ones so presently we are having uh, 70 plus startups who are doing their things and they are uh, in different zone of their startup journey and uh, uh, and with this we we are making them enable to to start their things and uh, and in in their their entrepreneurial life span we are we are going to connect with many uh many aspects aspect so uh, i invite prakash singh uh, badoria sir for uh, for giving a, a brief introduction about derek and uh, gary gary pro gary sir so that we can have uh, uh, uh our our students and our startups can also so know about them and gsd venture studio and then we can start this this session so uh prakar sir you can start now okay thank you anurag sir thank you sir so okay. so so in the end every startup is different but in the beginning every startup is the same by richi norton with these positive words our team that is dr anurag sd rai director professor prakar singh modaria senior incubation manager and mr vishnu prasad markam ji executive at kalchuri alan city group incubation center alan city and anupam incubation and innovation center alan city university uh, heartily welcomes you all in the sixth master class under aspire acceptor program on silicon valley hacks to go global for this session our special guest speakers are mr gary parlor who is ceo president co founder of gsd venture studios and mr derek restenfield coo and co founder gsd venture studio so here are some brief about our speakers first i would like to tell about mr gary feller gary has 30 years of operational marketing sales and executive leadership experience including a 1.35 billion dollar exit and a successful nasdaq ipo he has founded 15 companies including diva investments yva.ai gva launch gurus venture fund gsd venture studios broadian etc under his leadership yva.ai was named one of the top 10 ai hr tech companies globally gary was recently named one of the top 10 most influential ai executive to watch in 2020 he is a writer at forbes magazine and published over 60 articles on ai and technology over the last year so welcome gary sir sir now about derek deshfield sir derek is known for both bringing revolutionary new ideas to organizations that deliver explosive growth and for displaying a high tolerance for ambiguity and complexity for over 15 years derek deshfield sir has blazed high impact career in startups corporations governments and non profit organizations that range from 0 dollar to 2 billion dollars he is the operational mastermind coo and co-founder behind the success of gsd venture studio mr derek brings a variety of resources together to deliver explosive growth for gsd portfolio companies additionally he lectures on startup growth and leading universities and writes for forbes.com analytic insight magazine honored direct as a 40 under 40 innovator for his work in redefining the future of tech through cutting edge innovation 
yahoo.com called derek one of the one of 2020's most influential people us inside insider referred to him as a top entrepreneur to watch in 2021 so uh, for this i again welcome both the experts in today's session welcome derek sir and welcome uh, gary sir in our in the today's session welcome sir thank you so much for having us we're thank excited you. to be here um I will turn it over to uh, my partner and friend, Gary Fowler, who will open up with some comments. And then I will go next with some, some thoughts on how to go global and start a company. And then we will um, unmute everyone and you can either type in questions or ask them at, at the end. So without further ado, I'll turn over the guy that needs no introduction, Gary Fowler. Yeah, great to be here. Great to see you. Uh, Fabrique, Ron, John, Vivek, Natish, Toshin, Sinu, Atul. I mean, it's great, Ashok. It's great to be here. My name's Gary Fowler. And as I said, I've done 17 companies actually. Now I've written 162 articles, primarily focused on AI, quantum computing, cybersecurity, because <clears throat> think about our lives how much data is around each and every one of us, how much data in the health tech side. So if we look today, there's about 49 zettabytes of data on the planet Earth. Well, people say, well, what does that mean, 49 zettabytes? I don't know what a zettabyte is. Well, if you took CDs or DVDs and stacked them one on top of another, it would go 35 times between the Earth and the moon today. But the challenge is it's grown at almost 68% per year. We are, as my most recent article in Forbes magazine, as of last week says, in a state of infobesity. We look at each one of you. Think about your own personal worlds. How many times in the last two weeks has somebody said, Natesh Toshin, Atul, Vibu, uh, I've sent you a message. Did you get it? Where did you send it? I sent it to your uh, email. Which one? Um, I think I sent it to Google. Um, you look, you come back and say, when did you send it? A week and a half ago. Will you resend it again? I can't find it. Now, isn't it amazing? You are bright. You know technology, but you can't find your own stuff. It's crazy. But this is a problem that the world has is experiencing. The challenge is that each and every one of you here has about 300,000 items in your personal cloud. Well, what does that mean? Well, the entire web in 1996 was 257,000 websites. You at all, you Junji, Nitish, Toshin, Suchitra, you each have more information in your personal cloud than the entire web in 96. The problem is that number doubles every year. In five years, you're gonna have 10 million items. We are in a state of infobesity. So health tech, it doesn't matter which vertical market, having the technology to be able to understand how to deal with that data and make sensible decisions and or use an unsupervised AI that can help us. Much like your mother or grandmother in a kind way, compassionate way to help us make decisions in our lives and make decisions for us. So that's where the future is. And so each to each and every one, I did my, I've done my first company, did my first company at 21 years old. And I remember I had nobody to really guide me down the path. There was an uncharted territory. <clears throat> and as I was going down through that journey, you make a lot of mistakes, you learn a lot, you learn the hard way. But at the same time, think about it. You can have the greatest product or service in the world. It's like having a Ferrari in your garage. If you, nobody else knows it's a Ferrari and Satish, you have your, that Ferrari, or Aditya, in the garage, who? what's the matter? Let's get it out in the track. Well, a startup's kind of like a Ferrari. What we need to do is get it on the global stage. We need to go global. We believe there's really two pieces to going global, three pieces to going global. One is acceleration, two is regional dominance, and then three, and the most important part is how do you do the next level to go global? In our case, and Derek's gonna talk about it a bit more, it's using Silicon Valley as important to the rest of the world. Today at GSD, we work in over 37 countries worldwide because we believe, as Derek says and, and um, repeats, 
that intellectual capacity is evenly spread around the world, but opportunities aren't. You each have an opportunity, but you got to get out. You got to get that product or service moved forward. You got to think positively about it. It's not about one of these things. Oh, I don't know. Can I do it? I don't know if I'm smart enough. I don't know if I have the connections. You got to just, as Nike says, just do it. You own that responsibility. Each one of you here need to look yourselves in the mirror and say, do I really want it? Or am I going to bullshit myself the rest of my life and just talk about it? Do you really want it? Can you grab it? Do you feel it? Can you visualize it? That's part of the, those are part of the soft skills of building a startup. You have the opportunity of the, a lifetime. India with the 1.3 billion people is rising. But at the same time, we have a lot of challenges. We have global warming. We have population of world increasing from 8.1 billion to 13 billion. We've got uh, water issues, energy issues. I mean, it's not like the energy, the hydrocarbons are going to come back, right? We got to come out with some innovative ways to use solar wind and other resources. But you, each, each one of you have that opportunity. Each one of you have the opportunity to make a difference on the planet. The question is, do you really want it? Well, today, when we're going down through this, Derek's going to talk about how we do it at GSD. By the way, GSD stands for Get Shit Done, because you know life's about execution, not about talking about it. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Derek. Derek, It's always hard following Gary. I don't know why I do this to myself. I could have taken control and, and gone first, but let me give it a, a try. Um, first off, I just want to say thank you for, for joining us both. I know that with the exception of money, time is probably one of your most scarce resources and I am always humbled that you took time to spend with us. I am going to do a really quick slide presentation because if not, I'll just get so overly excited, might wind off, off topic. Um, but thank you so much for, for joining. Um, there was a brief introduction about myself, but I'll kind of maybe talk a, a couple more things. Um, as they were nice enough to state in the bio, I've worked in several technology companies from $0 failures to $2 billion exits and pretty much everything in between. I always remind people that I'm hardworking, but not smart. So that means I'm not an engineer or a PhD. So I've held roles like CEO, COO, VP of sales and marketing, director of growth, roles like that. I also have started, built and sold a storytelling marketing firm. And then I sat on the other side of the table prior to GSD and we, um, at Bunker Labs, an accelerator in the US you could check out online where I seeded 350 companies that raised $99 million in venture capital. Um, today at GSD Venture Studios, that's the core thing that we do. As Gary says, we travel the world investing in resilient teams bold enough to go global. Typically, that is companies outside of Silicon Valley. Usually it's outside of America. Um, we also run a GSD Labs is a accelerator that we had. So between my time at Bunker Labs, where I seeded 350 companies, my time at GSD Venture Studios and our accelerator, I've seen hundreds of companies both be successful and be failure and fail. And one of the things that I've learned is that startups and being successful in startups is about leading in uncertainty. And one of the things that I think is important on how to lead in uncertainty is it ultimately comes down to effective communication. But what is crazy. When I was preparing for this talk, 
a topic that has been around since the days of Aristotle and has 58 million hits on Google, yet we're still discussing it today and we still have challenges. And so, you know, before we get too crazy, I do concede that there's not a silver, silver bullet. But what I was hoping to establish with my introduction is I do have the battle scars and some ideas on how to prevent you from making some of the same mistakes that I've made. Um, and so first, I want to tell you a story. And this is one of the most impactful stories I've ever heard. I actually didn't write it. And Gary, who's a pro prolific writer, didn't write it either. It was discussed in the best-selling book in the United States. It's called Good to Great. And Good to Great, for you readers, was written by Jim Collins. And it's a sensational book about he studies American companies and he's able to isolate 12 or 15 of the best performing companies. And he talks about the traits that made them good. And one of the things that Jim Collins speaks about in his book is about a guy named Admiral Stockdale. Admiral Stockdale was an admiral in the US Navy during our war with Vietnam. And Admiral Stockdale, was one of the highest ranking people that was a prisoner of war during the Vietnam War. I think he was the highest. And he also was imprisoned in the most difficult, hardest prison in Vietnam, where he was subjected to torture almost every single day. And Many of the people in that prison that he was in did not survive, but some did. And when he got back from the war, he survived and he actually studied why it was that some people survived and some didn't. And he got his PhD on this topic at Stanford University in California. And one of the things or the two things that Admiral Stockdale was able to isolate was that the people that survived had two things. They first had the confidence that they would survive. But they also coupled that confidence with the realistic situation on the ground. And so the people that said they would be home by Christmas or be home by their kid's birthday actually wound up dying. But the ones that understood the realistic situation on the ground, understood they would not be home by Christmas, understood that this was a bad situation, but had the unbelievable confidence that they would succeed were the people that survived. And I would not submit that starting a company is the equivalent to a prisoner of war camp. But what I would say is you must be realistic. You must face challenges head on. Yes, there's COVID right now. Yes, the economy is hard. Yes, you're far from Mumbai. But you must have the unbelievable confidence that you will succeed. And that is one of the most important things that I could express on how to lead in difficult times. The next thing is when you're leaving, leading in stressful times, it's time to act like an ER doctor, not a neurosurgeon. And what do I mean by that? Well, if you went in for neurosurgery, he would take many, many x-rays, or she would take many, many x-rays. Oftentimes, you'd be under a microscope. Neurosurgery could be 8, 10, 11 hours. Every cut 
would be debated and move slowly and methodically because if there's one slice that makes a mistake, you could be paralyzed or blind or worse. But an ER doctor or a trauma surgeon does not have that luxury. They make quick decisions. Oftentimes it's with 60 to 70% of the information that they need. And this is the way that you must lead in startups, especially during difficult times. And the one thing I wanna say is, we keep mentioning COVID because it's so obvious, but this year it's COVID and the Delta virus. You know, next year it's gonna be the something else. There's always gonna be hard times, but you have to make quick decisions with not all the information. If you wait for 100% of the information, you will move too slow. So I would rather make 80 decisions in a day and 60 of them be right than two or three that are always right. Because if not, you're going to move too slow compared to your competitors. All right. One thing that I think you should do to help you make these quick decisions and to help you lead like Admiral Stockdale is create an advisory board of people who've been there before. And a couple things on this advisory board. I think the most important thing is find people that have been in your shoes recently. Mark Zuckerberg does not have any idea how to raise pre-seed funding. Bill Gates would have no idea how to start a software company today. They're too far removed. And even if by some miracle you could get those guys on the phone, they would not have the time that you need to be an effective advisory board. So if you want to start a company, find someone that started a company a year ago to be on your advisory board. Or if you started a company and you want to get to certain locks in revenue, then find somebody that's recently done that, that could provide you actionable tips that's relevant to your situation today. And another tip, I think a lot of people make mentoring awkward. I think one of the most awkward things for a mentor is if you call them up or email them and say, I'd like for you to mentor me. I think <laughs> what you need to do is just contact somebody, ask them for help, but also offer to help them and be authentic and be real and don't make it a, mechanic, a mechanical relationship where you say, please mentor me, please tell me what to do. I think people that want to help enjoy helping others and will do it if they feel like they're being reciprocated, even if it's just providing them feedback on the advice they gave on why it worked, why it didn't work. But I would actually recommend never directly asking someone to be your, your mentor. The next tip is what is the CEO's and founder's job? There's actually only three, maybe four things that a CEO should do. But the first thing that I know a CEO should not do is to manage or to micromanage. The top three things that a CEO should do is create the mission, vision, and values of the company. He or she should recruit and maintain talent. And then the third thing, the most important thing, is to keep the company alive. Sometimes that means fundraising. Sometimes that means making sales. Sometimes that means borrowing. We have a saying in the United States, beg, borrow, deal. Whatever that is needed to keep your company alive is the job of the CEO. It is not to micromanage. The job is to find the best talent who will tell you what to do as the CEO. And now, in its earliest stages, you can do one extra thing, and that should be a skill that you already have. Like if you're an engineer or a developer, you can code. If you have sales experience, you can help with sales, et cetera. 
But really, the job of the CEO as your organizations grow is to set the mission, vision, and values to recruit and maintain talent and keep the company alive. Now, one of the things that you have to do as a leader is to reserve time to communicate. And oftentimes, I think at least in America, there's this vision that the CEO is very extroverted and is always speaking to others and motivating people. And I think that that is, a, is one way to do it. But there are plenty of phenomenal introverts that are good at leaders too, are good leaders too. My advice to you as a future leader or as a current leader is you need to get good at one of two things. You either need to get really good at speaking or really good at writing. One of the two will help you communicate. Now, one of the things that's happening, especially in a post-pandemic world, is there's this thing called Zoom gloom, where leaders just do Zoom call after Zoom call after Zoom call. We used to have to go into traffic and meet people, but now with Zoom, we can just load up our calendars. And the problem with that is if you work eight hours a day and seven of the half of, of those hours, you are on Zoom, one of the biggest problem is you're not leaving any space on your calendar to lead. So whatever percentage your role is, whether you're a CEO or a vice president or a co-founder, whatever the percentage your role is, you have to leave that percentage open on your calendar to lead. If not, you will not have the time to communicate to your team. You will not be able to provide the mission, vision, and values. You will not be able to recruit talent, and you will not be able to keep your company alive. You will just get glossy-eyed from Zoom. And that is not what a leader should be doing. And so you must reserve what I call the white space on your calendar to lead your teams or your companies. Okay. Oftentimes, I hear from entrepreneurs, they know exactly what they're going to start. Their family grew up um, farming. And so they learned a lot about farming and they are experts at farming or they grew up with their dad who's a doctor and they identified a problem and they have a great idea and they learned how to do it because their dad taught them or their mom taught them. But what I would submit to you is make what you can sell, don't build what you can make. Make what you can sell, don't build what you can make. Just because you know how to make something or you have an idea that's intuitive doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to sell and that people want it. And so I think there's this natural thing to just gravitate to what you already know how to do when that might not be the same thing that your customers are going to gravitate to. So you have to do research and figure out what it is the market wants. Another important way to think about this is don't fall in love with your solution. Fall in love with the problem. Don't fall in love with your solution. Fall in love with the problem. If you want to solve pathology and how blood is collected, there are many, many ways to go about that problem, right? You could change the way nurses draw blood. You could create a new needle. You could work on a better finger prick. Um, there's lots and lots of different ways, but rather than fall in love with just one solution, conduct the research and see what people are willing to buy. And that's what you should make. 
The best companies in the world, like Amazon, like Tata, they follow the money. Follow the money, not your solutions. Have conversations. Please do not rely on surveys. Have direct conversations with people. It is the best way to find out if you have the right solution or what solution they need. Survey should be a last resort. You have to get, and I know it's hard in COVID. So if you can't do it in person, then it's got to be on Zoom, but you got to have those direct conversations and not rely on surveys. They will not help you at the earliest stages because surveys only work for companies like Facebook or Snapchat. If you could send it to a million people, you'll get you know 100,000 collected. You're, you're not going to have list that big. You need that direct information at the earliest stages. Um, and, you know, with this, it's kind of crazy to say you need to go out and talk to not one, two, three, four, but a hundred people. And it does take a village to start a company. So make sure you're cultivating that support from your family and from your loved ones as you continue to grow and think about that as you dare to enter this journey that we call entrepreneurship. From the beginning, what I would recommend and what we recommend in Silicon Valley is there's a co-founder agreement. When Gary and I first started GSD Venture Studios, the first thing we did together was an agreement between each other. How we were going to operate, how were you going to lead? I can't tell you how many times this gets missed. And in Silicon Valley, I know this is, might be a little controversial. What we recommend is all co-founders should be on a vesting schedule. And I will tell you that if you don't do this, investors in your first round of investment will place you on a vesting schedule where you're gaining a little bit of equity each month. Because the problem from the investor standpoint is if there's three co-founders, what happens if one leaves in year one and the other three stick around for 10 years? Does that guy that was there for one year get one third of the company? No, an investor won't invest in a situation like that, at least in Silicon Valley. And I think it's a better relationship to say, hey, we're all going to go on vesting schedule. So if one guy leaves because he gets bored or gets a job, he doesn't walk away with one third of equity in the example of three co-founders. So he would walk away with a lot less. One of the things that happens when you start a company is everyone's going to come out of the woodwork and want to partner with you, partner with you, and partner with you. I will tell you that there's been very few startups in the history of startups that have gotten their unicorn status because of partnerships. There's been many, many more that have succeeded because they've sold things. And so obviously partnerships are important. But you need to follow the money and focus on what will get you paid and what you can sell. Controversially, I would say ignore partners and focus on sales. Follow the money. Tips for attorneys, and this is kind of an international thing, but the one thing I would say is, Bad legal documents don't blow fundraising rounds, but the wrong attorneys do. So when you're in India, work with Indian lawyers that know startups, not ones that like handle, you know, wills, um, people that have experience with startups. Um, you know, when you're in, when you expand to the U.S., use a U.S. law firm. Uh, when you expand into China, use a Chinese law firm. You know, attorneys aren't always the easiest to work with. But one of the things I've learned is if you follow up quickly, 
you'll save money and time. Because one of the flaws in the legal profession or challenges is if they send you something and you don't respond for a month, they actually don't remember your case. So now they, you respond a month later and now they got to go look at your file and refresh their memory and refresh everything that they're doing for you. And that causes delays versus if you respond the next day. And so lawyers can be a big source of referrals, use them. Another thing in the US, some of the bigger firms, if you do ever want to enter the US will defer fees. Um, and some of you might not be comfortable working in other countries. What I would say is look for law firms that work in both. And there's plenty of global law firms that work in India and work in another country that you want to expand to. So make sure, and maybe this is obvious, but become an expert in your industry. And what I mean by that is, if you wanna go into medicine and you wanna start a company into medicine, obviously you're gonna learn a lot about your industry, but develop your expertise and your reputation. Read, write, build a community, blog. If you're not a blogger, start events. If you're not an event starter, start a podcast, start a Facebook page, do something where you're developing a community and providing value. Again, focusing on the problem that you're interested in, not necessarily the solution. So one of the things that I did that I kind of told you about in the beginning was, is I helped start, build, and sell a storytelling marketing firm called Cult Following. And cult following was a metaphor to a religious cult. And we had a three-phase process, recruit, indoctrinate, spread, that we would take companies through. Again, a, a metaphor. But it is also how I think about startups today. So in the recruit phase, what you want to do is develop a following. This is something you could be doing right now. Like I said, you could be blogging, you could be podcasting, you could be developing a Facebook group centered around the problem that you are seeking to solve. And then when you're ready to launch a company, you could indoctrinate those users into your product or into your company. And then you could use those same users or another way, those raving fans that have followed you since the beginning, since you were in school, and you could spread your company like wildfire. And this should be intuitive for many of you. This is the value of being an Instagram influencer, but using it for a business and centered around a problem, not just looking good in your swimsuit. One example is this company here. They're called Hire Club. And they provide coaching to help people out of work get into work. They're a semi-unremarkable company, to be honest with you. I mean, they help people find jobs. It's a great service. But the first thing that they did before they launched a website, before they launched a product, is they developed a Facebook group with over 35,000 users, helping people that were looking to hire and looking for jobs on both sides of the marketplace. And they have one of the best Facebook pages, at least in the US, on how to find a job because they made it authentic and real and helpful. And so that's an example of recruit. Recruit the users onto a Facebook page, launch the website, indoctrinate them into your your website, and then spread like wildfire once you provide a good service. Another example is this company here. They're called Mean Queen. They're just an Instagram page of influencers. They grew this page to over 6 million followers, mostly women between 18 and 26. 
And you might ask, well, what is their business? I will tell you, it doesn't matter. You have 6 million engaged followers on Instagram that you've recruited. The way you indoctrinate them and you follow the money is this particular page launches a new product almost every week. And they have people that love the page and, and love it. Um, and of course, it's around memes and, and, and that, but they establish that credibility. They found a following, people that enjoy the value of their memes, and then they trust them when they launch products. And they do very, very well doing this. So there's been several unicorns from companies, all from emerging markets. And here's just five of them. And I know what some of you are saying. Well, that's only five company. Well, here's many, many more. And I believe that you can, do, you can be next if you believe and lead in uncertain times. And so thank you again so much for taking the time. I am the co-founder and COO of GSD Venture Studios, but I'm an entrepreneur first and foremost, and I will help anybody at any time. Just reach out. Here's my information here. I also put my link tree inside of the chat. Uh, Gary posted his LinkedIn. We are always available to help. And right now we're happy to take any questions, I will, uh, you could either come on the video and ask, I'll just give you the permission to unmute, or you could type it in the chat, whichever is best. Uh, hang on. Uh, Gary, could you let people unmute? My computer is messing up. Um. You have to put me as a co-host, right? I think you are, no? Hold on. Well, if anyone has any questions, you could type it in the chat and then we'll unmute you too. Well, no questions? Uh, anyone want to ask something from the participants? Atul, oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah, you, uh, you can now unmute yourself. So I, you were enabled now. Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm sorry. I was typing uh, slowly. I think. Go I ahead, Adol. Yeah. Hey, hi, Gary. Uh, hi, Derek. So hi. Uh, I think the session was very wonderful. Uh, the pointers I got from both of you were, you know, amazing. Uh, like it started with, you know, the Gary talked about, you know, data. Data is uh, the new oil. You can say so. We have we have our core company's name also data data. So it seems to be in the similar lines. But yeah, uh, I'll come to the question. Uh, so uh, you were mentioning, uh, director was mentioning like uh, you know every every co-founder has to be on the vesting uh, period, uh, vesting equity. So uh, the question is, you know, like initially when we have hundred uh, percent equity and we let's say we we vested it for let's say three years. Uh, like 10 10 percent increasing every year let's say so what uh whatever is the left equity at initial stage to whom will it be allocated like i'm not uh sure and where where will be it will be actually allocated so different markets have different philosophies obviously and you have to do what what goes to market so typically what I would recommend if you had, let's just say three or four co-founders okay. is that you would create a four-year vesting cycle where you would say, look, we each get a third and it doesn't have to be that way, but let's just say it was. So we mm -hmm. each get 33 and a third percent that we would get monthly on a 48 month vesting schedule. Okay. And so that way, if one of the guys, you know, or gals gets married or decides that they don't want to do the startup, they're only walking away with the time that they did it. Because what happens a lot is three people start a company, they each get a third. And then what happens when a guy wants to quit after six months? Like that's where it's unfair to the other two, because now 30% of the company is gone. And 
they're just left with 60. And now you have someone that's on your cap table that is really not operating. So it's very un, um, impressive and unappetizing for an investor, right? Because you have a guy that owns a third of the company that is not even operating and only helped for like four months and it couldn't operate even if you wanted to. So it just creates tension. Oftentimes it leads to breakup and challenges. Just saying like, look, we all own 100%. But we need to all work for it and stay here. And if someone leaves early, you're going to leave with less because that's only fair. Um, and so that's the, um, the, the goal. And then the second part of your question, just to elaborate where equity goes. And again, this is Silicon Valley dependent, but typically between 10 to 20% of the equity goes to an option pool. And then an, an employee stock option pool. And then the remaining equity, honestly, where it goes, you get diluted with your fundraising rounds. But your value, so your percentage you own goes down, but the value of the company goes up. So it's yeah. better to own a little bit of a billion dollar company than 100% of a hundred dollar company. Yeah, I got that point, Eric. But uh, the question was, you know, like, when we started, let's say, just taking your example itself, like one third of the equity. So the first year, let's say, uh, there are uh, two, two co-founders, or let's say three of them as per your example. So uh, initially I have 10% of it, uh, all three of us uh, like have 10, 10% of it. So 30% is allocated to the people already. But where is the 70%? Like who, who, who should have it till the vesting period completes? I mean, it's just kind of in the corporation legally. Okay. I mean, you guys okay. have it. It's just that you don't own it if someone okay. walked away. If, for, for example, let's just say you had 10% yeah. um, and the company was bought tomorrow mm -hmm. by payment or whoever, okay. you're, you would automatically invest all of the shares that would be yours. So in okay. this example you would get 33% of the million dollars you were bought for. So it would automatically vest. But if you okay. left, mm -hmm. if you left, you know, one fourth of the way through, you would only walk away with 10% if you were acquired. Does that make sense? So yeah, it's still no, there. Sense. It's just not, well, you just ha can't leave with it if, if something were to happen. And so- it, it really protects everybody, I think, to do it that way because it isn't fair. Two guys start a company together and six mm -hmm. months into it, one of the guy wants to leave. Now you have a decision to make. Do I start over or do I just give him like 5% because he helped start it, but I'm going to work it for the next several years. So that's the, the philosophy. But if, mm -hmm. you, would, if you were on a vesting schedule and the company gets bought, all your shares would vest and you would reap all those rewards. That is true. Yeah. Thank you. That, that answers my question. Thank you. Awesome. Does anyone else? Yeah. So regarding that, like, uh, isn't that already covered by shareholding pattern, right? So if somebody has 50% shares, he has 50% share. Can't we dilute his share? Like we can get more money in and raise more shares into it. And he automatically gets diluted. Sure. So, I mean, he will get diluted but the the premise is if two guys start a company and or three i think three is a better example if three people start a company and you get 33 percent each which is the common way of doing it and one of the guys leaves after six months you know under a, 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 what i see a lot is that guy walks away with a third of the company or and he's not he working he or he lost his 33% revenue because he invested, say, th 3 lakhs rupees or 300,000 pounds or whatever you call it. He lost his revenue, but he what you don't want is you don't want him to control one third of the company. Like, that's just yeah, not we, fair. I, I know. So we could just issue more share. Like, you know, we can just say, hey, so he, since he left, we are that decision taker. We can just issue more share to our, ourselves, you know, and invest like a little bit more money. Like, you know, we can invest, raise share for one pound or whatever we like and increase our shareholding. 
that's that's how legal yeah i don't want to like derail this into a boring legal discussion what i would just say is you should have a co-founder agreement and talk about all these things it's kind of like you know, nothing, no one plans for a divorce, but if you do get divorced, there is a, actually a high percentage that you will as co-founders. It statistically will happen. So I would discuss this. So you could use your way if that works, um, or you could use my way. I think what's more important is you discuss it and have that relationship and have that agreement. And I would encourage putting it in writing. There's not like a formal co-founder agreement document, which is why it's a little strange, or at least in the US, there's not. But I would put something together in writing, like I'm going to be the CEO. This is what we're going to do. This is how much money I'm going to write in. This is what happens if somebody leaves. So because statistically, somebody is going to leave. Does that make sense? Yeah, so the other thing is what you want to think about is getting into a startup is not easy. As Derek was saying, it's like being married. There are ups and downs and ins and outs. There are pivots. I can't tell you how many times through the startups that uh, different startups I've been involved in from uh, Israeli startup to uh, Eva to GSD, there's always pivots. It's not easy. And if you think it's easy coming in, you know, you're in the wrong game. Get a job with Tata. Get a job with one of the companies, the large companies, and, and um, if that's what you want. But if you're into this, you got to understand it's not easy. You only hear, you know, when Elon Musk uh, succeeds with Tesla, you don't hear about when he took all his money uh, from PayPal and was vesting in SpaceX and Tesla um, and had his money uh, spread around that he, you know, literally if something would have gone bad, he would have failed, right? You only hear about the good stories. Well, let me tell you, having been through this, you know, 17 times, what happens is you got to understand you're in it to win it. You're in it to succeed at an entirely different level. If you want to go global, that's entirely different set, right? That is, you know, we look at Silicon Valley as a port to the rest of the world from our standpoint, whether it's an Indian company, Chinese, Russian. And by the way, I worked in Russia 14 years. So we know a little bit about acceleration in Russia, but the key is how can I get out there using networks and contacts, using the knowledge, incredible knowledge that you have, sales and marketing and management expertise and trust, especially today with COVID, trust is really important. Here we are virtually all over the world today. Right, Derek's in, uh, actually, I don't know where you are today, Derek. Are you on the West Coast? Are you in the middle of the U.S.? <laughs> I'm in, in Michigan. Palm yeah, so Derek's in Michigan. Right now, I'm in Palm Beach. In two weeks, I'll be back in California. So it doesn't matter where you are, but trust is important. So here's one, of, I'll give you some secrets, some of the secret sauce. One is you need to build an intergenerational team because you need people that have the credibility and trust to be able to pull it off in the history. Two is you need cultural diversity, right? Make sure that you make the company culturally diverse, females, males, Asian, uh, all everybody. Make sure it's diverse. Why? Because statistically it proves that it becomes a much stronger, much higher probability the company's gonna have success. And the other side of decentralization, You've got incredible resources in India, incredible science resources in places like Russia, Ukraine, Belarus. Use those resources. I mean, this is not rocket scientists. I grew up on a farm in Pennsylvania, a little tiny uh, village of 500 people. You know, if it was black and white, it had horns, it's a cow. So keep it simple, stupid. So you want to look at markets. Look where places that other people don't go, as Warren Buffett says. Look where there's opportunities. We know today, I just told you about data. I mean, you feel the pain. I know for all 41 of us here today, feel the pain of data every day. As smart as you are, you feel the pain, right? Atul, with data turtles, you hear about it. Yeah. But the question is, it's now time to do something about it. Because another three years of this, we're going to be in a state of learned helplessness. People can't make decisions anymore. They're so inundated. How many hours a day do you pick up your phone? Three? four, five, it's crazy. Your phone is now like your hand. 
So we need to come up with an entirely new set of tools. We need compassion. We need emotion. I write a lot about compassion, emotion with AI. We can't just have pragmatic AI. We need to have not smart, but intelligent assistance. We need to look at the world entirely differently. And then we need to figure out how we can take this. You know, we're, we're here we are on this amazing planet that we haven't done good things with. You know, whether it's the US or India, it doesn't matter. Every country contributes a bit, but we now need to clean it up. We need to do something good for our planet. And we are at the same time, we need to look at, you know, the worlds uh, beyond. There's 6 billion Earth-like planets in the Milky Way galaxy, estimated 2 trillion galaxies in the universe today. We're going to need incredible technologies to explore other planets. When I say Earth-like, that means they're close enough to the sun to sustain life. So these, you know, this is like, it's, it's bigger than uh, electricity was at the beginning of the 20th century. It's the real evolution of humanity, but each and every one of you here have, have a chance to be able to make their impact. Let's try to do it to make humanity better. Let's try to do it so we live longer, better quality lives, and let's democratize the opportunity. So it doesn't matter where you are, that everybody has an equal shot of doing it. Uh, Prakash, we are having question from Kumar Gautam also. Maybe Kumar is with us. Kumar, you can ask uh, uh, your question directly also. Yeah. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, uh, actually, I'm a founder of Curious, and uh, my entire research is based on quantum computing. And uh, I published several papers. And also, uh, um, I got some fund from the government of India uh, on based on the quantum communication. So uh, basically, my concern is basically uh, right now we are doing uh, and we are uh, already submitted some proposal to some uh, some institution from uh, uh, abroad also. One of the colleagues is basically based on US based and in India also. So my entire work is basically based on the ion trap based quantum computing. So uh, I definitely I am looking. Uh, my startup is just two year completed, but uh, yeah, definitely in India it's very difficult to get the fund from uh, the in, in quantum especially. So I had done PhD in on that, and right now because uh, obviously Gray is already at the putting the things is he is a quantum guy, so I am very impressed on that and something like that. I want to entangle with you and looking some seed money and uh, want to collaboration and more and more an opportunity in that field. So how exactly to start and how to collaborate and is there any like a uh, is the process or any scheme or like that? So just clarify that uh, how to get the benefit from if I want to, if suppose I will get connect with you guys and that this is my basic questions. Yeah, I'm, you know, so as we know, the quantum computers, I just actually, if you get a chance, check out, we did a uh, interview with Harvard Quantum Lab. You're right. I mean, quantum computers are just happening uh, at the right level today. As you know, Kumar, they can be 100 million times faster than a, the fastest supercomputer. For each one of us here, what does that mean? That means what would take 10,000 years of supercomputer takes 200 seconds on a quantum. And this is uh, Google's quantum. That doesn't mean that every application that will run that fast or we even work right, but we're moving in an entirely different ways. Think about this. Imagine the possibility of quantum and AI connected together. Think about all the solutions. At the same time, look at it, the other side of it for cybersecurity and the risks it imposed. So uh, in terms of where you are, Kumar, I don't know what product you have, whether you've developed anything or it's just a theory, but you're at the beginning of this large curve. One is you need a lot of visibility. Two is you need to show, you know, one of the things that always works if you have some revenue that you can show in some way, shape, or form. Somebody's really interested in buying it. And for each one of you, it's the same thing. If, you, if people want to grab it out of your hands, that's when it becomes really interesting to investors because it means it's real. One of, uh, one of the other things, just remember this. You, you got to be really careful. There's an effect where you're, you and your founders start to believe it so much that it becomes true but in reality, nobody wants to buy it. And at the over-engineering, that sometimes takes the companies out of business. 
So make sure you're doing customer development all the time, uh, all of you, to go out and say, is this interesting? What I do, and I've done, my, my partner in EVA is Dr. David Yang. He's a billionaire from Russia who lives in Silicon Valley. He and I would walk down the streets in Palo Alto, and we would take our iPhones, so we recorded it, and we would do PowerPoint presentations on our computer to see what people would think before we even developed the product. We would mock it up. So think about those kind of things because it's important. Kumar, it depends on where you are in quantum. You do need that visibility, but you need a product, you know, something to be able to show people. Theories are really difficult to get funded at um, a seed level. It's more research institutes are interested in that. Actually, I'm in a prototype in between the POC is already completed. So I am just uh, trying to build the prototype. And uh, this is a small sensor based exactly. We are. Uh, Quantum computing is one of the like uh, uh, technology and I am applying on that in some medical field or like a FinTech even also. But I am using on uh, communication especially because I got the point from the communication. So I want to establish some entanglement property of the two. I, we, are, we want to transmit the entangled atoms. It's very difficult. Nobody are talking about that. The already China has published and, and they already did on uh, photon sphere. But I have proposed and already published my paper in Springer that on that way and this is the totally new things so that's why i'm asking is there any opportunity to to if you give the some like that uh, link to pitch my ideas as a like i i not this is not uh, right now we are not build the product uh, product but yeah definitely we are in between that the like i mean the uh, thing because, is kamar i written an article about this so look up uh, my name in quantum communications the wireless communications and the impact so my suggestion is send something over and we can take a look at it, okay? Okay. Anybody else? Anybody else is having yeah. any question? Good evening, sir. Yeah. Hi, Gary and hi, Derek. Uh, thank you for such an informative session. Uh, yeah, I would be grateful if you could shed some light on the types of equity in a startup. In terms of in terms of who gets what and how that works. Derek, do you want to run through it or you want me to run through it? I don't even know, is Derek here? So um, here's the deal and we can work backwards on it. So the employee stock pool is really important. You want to do 15 to 20% from an employee stock pool standpoint. Uh, the founders, so why is that important? Because on a global basis, if you're going to take that company out to market, they're always going to have, the investors are always going to check and see how you're going to reward people coming into the company. If you're going to bring in senior executives to the company, you're t depending on what stage you are, if it's an idea stage, et cetera, it can be anywhere from, you know, two to, to depending on the level of the person, two to 10%, two to 5%, something like that with a four-year vesting schedule. So then as the company matures, you've proven your product market fit, it works, you get customers, it starts to scale back, you know, half a percent. And by the way, don't do it in percentage, do it on number of shares because sometimes get themselves, themselves in trouble because they make it so they're non-dilutable and they have a percentage of the company forever. So make sure it's based on shares. Um, and there's some models out there. If you just Google it, you can see the, a number of the venture firms have talked about what it should look like. And you want to use those guidelines because if you want to get funded, they're going to look to make sure you conform. Also, make sure you don't have more than three co-founders. Um, companies have done it like Facebook, but in general, they don't want to see more than three. The reason is because what happens is companies can't make decisions and it's hard to make a decision. so much Kevin. sure uh if anyone else is having any questions so we can ask or professor we can uh, we can wind up uh, do you able to share uh yes slide for certificate of appreciation okay so you can find a conclude i will share this uh, share my screen now so uh, thank you, uh, Gary, sir, and thank you, Derek, sir, for, for being with us today and sharing this great insight about 
uh, about a startup journey and how to make 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 a startup into into global network and other kind of uh, kind of real practical aspects regarding data regarding company compliances and how to pitch our uh, our data and how to to onboard uh, startups who which are which are really needed in our uh, present day day environment we have to be very much practical while pitching our things each and every time so this is the greatest insight which uh, which is which is which was given to to the startups and students of ours who are connected with us and uh, uh as uh, we are connected with uh, startups of kalchuri lln city incubation center and anupam incubation innovation center lln city university bhopal india and i will also love to invite you guys at bhopal whenever it will be feasible for us uh, uh if this pandemic and all those things get normal because in india things are getting normal day by day and we are expecting that after december uh, it will be getting more normal and we will be able to invite you physically to our university and our incubation center also and we are we are very much thankful to direct sir uh, also for for connecting with us uh, while having our first conversation and then we started uh, being connected with gsd venture studio also we have launched one aspire accelerator program in this 40 plus startups uh, who are having revenue also from across uh, india from all directions of india are with us and uh, apart from that 25 student startups are also with us because these are student startups they are very much intact with their studies and all those different aspects but these 40 startups are doing great and they are uh, and they are doing good businesses also and we are uh we are in uh, in process to connect with them and correcting many kind of things and myths also uh, in in the journey of this aspire accelerator and i i am thankful to both of you to uh, have taken your precious time and because time and data is money in, in nowadays more than more than money there is time and data which is which is the future investment so thank you for investing in our startups with your time and uh, your insight and uh, i would like to thank gary sir with uh, certificate of recognition from uh, from our uh, lln city group of institutes and kalchuri lln city incubation center and anupam incubation innovation center i will also share this with via whatsapp also and uh, via mail to direct sir and i will also thank to direct sir also for 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 being in connect with us and and also for being in so personally connected with us via whatsapp also because we are we are also sharing uh, other informations regarding our aspire accelerator program with him and it's being great with you guys and uh, thanks for being connected with us and being being partner of our Uh, incubation center we will we will ensure you to bring the best startups and best uh, uh, connects from india uh, to to you people so thank you and stay connected with us and from my team uh, uh, i will like to thank prakar singh badoria sir uh, vishnu sir Uh, also for for being in in connect with us uh, entirely during our program which we are we are running and the startup who <laughs> believe in us from across india and uh, across india so thank you everyone for being uh, connected to uh, us one thing i yes. want to say if if it is possible can everyone open their video so that we can take a snapshot yes if it yes is possible yeah thank you So please uh, kindly switch on your video also that we can take a snapshot with Derek sir and uh, Gary sir. Maybe with thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one minute. I'm taking a snapshot. Huh? Yeah, you can make a thumbs up according to Derek sir. <laughs> <laughs>
yeah thank you so much so thank you thank you everyone for being connected with us thank you gary sir and thank you derek sir sure. it's our pleasure thank you thank you sir go get them stay thank positive. you stay happy and stay healthy and go get them if we can help yes. we're all around when you're ready to go global give us a call we believe we're the best in the world yes sir and sir praveen sir is also at uk so you you people can also connect with praveen sir uh, he is he is already at uk and you people are uh, are very near to him and he is also doing very much things in data and other kind of aspect in even in agriculture also he is doing a, he is doing great job there so right. uh, he connect uh, he is having things at our uh, us uh, farms near mansoor also but he is operating from uk so you guys can be connected with him he is probably shared is connect and i will share uh, your yours connect with him also so thank Perfect. you thank you everyone thank, thank you, you thank you have a great day bye bye, bye, -bye. good bye. luck everybody thank you bye bye, bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Anurag sir, we can uh, end the meeting. So you are you are host now. <laughs>